May I ask you to take your seats, please? That's not working. This works? Posso falar em português? Não. Não, não, estou a brincar. Estou a brincar. Eu ouvi falar português, foi por isso. Good evening, everyone. So good evening, everyone. I think I still have to say good afternoon, good morning from wherever you are connecting, but it's so nice to see so many faces in this room, so many champions in this room. And let me welcome you all to this high level dialogue hosted by the Global HIV Prevention Coalition. My name is Monica, and I'm the head of the uh, UNFP office here in Geneva. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today in a room full of champions with so much energy to celebrate all the successes, to map the course that we, we still need to, to follow, but mainly to do it together. And this is what we have for you tonight. Tonight, we're going to take you on a journey on a journey towards accelerating HIV prevention and preparing for future pandemics. And I guess you all have in your table the roadmap. And this is what we're gonna ask you to keep on reminding yourself of the roadmap that we have to achieve the goals that are bringing us here together tonight. Um, let me do a bit of housekeeping um, before we start. We have interpretation available in French, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and Chinese. And for the people in this room, you may switch the channel of your preference. For the people outside this room, please go to the bottom, to the bottom of your Zoom window. And next to the share icon, uh, click on the interpretation icon and choose your preferred language. So, Today we have um, gathered for you an amazing, amazing panels and uh, wonderful speakers that will share with you um, their experiences, their lessons learned, and will um, help us to understand how we can seize the unique opportunities available to us to accelerate HIV prevention now, and by doing that, prepare for future pandemics. But to, um, to start our conversation and to frame the conversation, of course, we will have welcome remarks from the amazing executive director of UNAIDS, Winnie Biniaima. Winnie, you have the floor. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you so much, Monica. That bit of amazing is amusing me. <laughs> but thank you so much. Excellencies, honorable ministers, on Excellency Ambassadors, partners, colleagues, and friends, good evening and welcome to UNAIDS. We are in the Kofi Annan Conference Room. Welcome. A special thanks first to the government of Germany, the chair of our program coordinating board and the government of Kenya, the vice chair of our program coordinating board, for co-hosting this ministerial meeting. The Global Prevention Coalition was founded in 2017, and its purpose is to strengthen and sustain political commitment and accountability for delivering prevention services at scale. While the coalition's focus was initially on the 28 countries that had a high HIV incidence. This evening, I'm pleased, honored to welcome an additional six countries, the Philippines, South Sudan, Madagascar, Colombia, Rwanda, and Kazakhstan. I would really like to thank the governments of these six countries for accepting our invitation to join the coalition, we are stronger with you. The cost of inaction and the urgency to accelerate HIV prevention efforts can't be overstated. 
we had in 20, at the last count, 2021, the count for 2022 is coming in July, but in 2021, we had over 1.5 million new HIV infections. We are not on track to achieve the global target. We are several times over the, the global target of fewer than 370,000 new infections annually. So we are way off track on prevention. And this is not because we don't know how to prevent HIV infections. We do, we know how to. This is because not all people everywhere have the same chance to access affordable, high quality prevention tools. And because in many places, punitive laws and policies and stigma and discrimination prevent people from coming forward to access life-saving prevention. The reasons we are off track, our targets, the reasons I keep insisting are the inequalities that people face and disable them from getting the prevention tools they need. We must address these inequalities, these structural drivers that increase the risk for some people. And by some people, I mean in particular, adolescent girls and young women, especially in Africa, LGBTQ people, and mem other members of key populations globally. We must reach them if we are to reach our prevention goals. The theme for this year's World Health Assembly is saving lives and driving health for all. Indeed, successful HIV present prevention is not just good for each person but who accesses prevention, but it's good for public health, for all people. And I must add, it is part of preparing the world for the next pandemic. So investing in current pandemics like HIV will help countries to prepare for future ones. I might say it's really the only way to prepare for future ones, to be able to fight and win the current ones. We have only three years to achieve the targets we all agreed at the last high level meeting of the United Nations on HIV AIDS. In this one hour of our meeting, in this just one hour, 171 people will be newly infected with HIV. A tap is running. Each and every one of these preventions is, each and every one of these infections could be avoided, is preventable. That's why as global leaders in the HIV response, we must act with urgency. Urgency to prioritize, to advocate and make bold investments urgency to remove discriminatory and punitive laws and the structural barriers that limit access to services and prevention choices, especially for key populations and for girls and young women. That's why we are here this evening. And I thank you so much and hand back to the amazing Monica. Thank you, Winnie, for those very inspiring words. And I think it's very clear that now more than ever, success is possible in preventing HIV. Um, never has the opportunity to prevent HIV been greater than today. And we also heard your cry for urgency. And um, now I would like to invite um, Ambassador Katarina Stasch from um, Germany um, to, um, to deliver welcome remarks um, as chair of the uh, UNAIDS board. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's indeed a great honor and pleasure to be on the podium with so many dear and amazing friends. <laughs> Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, um, 
Dear colleagues and friends, I'm honored to welcome you all to today's ministerial meeting of uh, this Global HIV Prevention Coalition. And as a long-term supporter of UNAIDS, and as, the, as Monica has said, the current UNAIDS PCB chair, alongside our valued co-chair, Inja, it is a particular pleasure for Germany to co-host this side event. Prevention has been a cornerstone of the German HIV response and has contributed to a continuous reduction in new HIV infections. We attribute our success to a rights-based approach that engages and empowers young people and key populations. In particular, comprehensive sexuality education has proven to be effective in equipping young people with knowledge and skills to adopt safe sexual behavior. Moreover, the administration of low threshold HIV testing and treatment, pre-exposure, prophylaxis, and harm reduction interventions for key populations contributed to a great success in the decline of HIV infections and AIDS-related deaths in Germany. Apart from our national efforts towards ending the AIDS ep epidemic, we are dedicating to supporting HIV prevention through our bilateral health programs, for instance, in Zambia. Since its establishment in 2017, Germany has been a member of the GPC and our support for accelerating HIV prevention has been unwavering ever since. The GPC progress reports powerfully demonstrate the impact of the GPC's HIV prevention roadmap around the world and the majority of GPC focus countries observed a decline in new HIV infections. And I think this is a really great success. We are pleased that several focus countries managed to further accelerate HIV prevention programs and achieved major steps in expanding the rollout of antiterritorial therapy. Core to the success of GPC is the strategic guidance by UNAIDS. The Global AIDS Strategy 2021 to 2026 does not only provide strategical orientation, but also navigates the global AIDS response by WHO and the Global Fund. And we have the colleague over there. Well, despite the great progress achieved, multiple challenges still lie ahead of us. It is therefore more urgent than ever to get back on track to achieving the 2025 HIV prevention targets. Hence, we are looking forward to today's HIV prevention status update and to discuss with you the main barriers for progress and how to overcome them. Finally, let me draw the link to our important general efforts to be better prepared for the next pandemic. By investing in HIV prevention, we improve public health infrastructure, promote risk communication and awareness, and all of these investments pay out with regard to other infection threats. Germany remains strongly committed to promoting evidence-based interventions in HIV prevention while upholding human as well as sexual and reproductive rights. In doing so, we support the highly important and valued work of the GPC. Now, thank you very much, everybody, for coming here this evening, spending time with us, and I'm looking forward to a very constructive and informative discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thank you um, to, the, um, to the government of the Federal Republic of Germany for this very strategic um, um, dialogue and for um, highlighting the importance of international collaboration in HIV prevention and pandemic preparedness. And, um, and now I would like to invite um, His Excellency, Dr. Sultani uh, Matendecero uh, from the Ministry of Health uh, from Kenya, uh, also the co-chair of the UNAIDS board to give us welcoming remarks. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, uh, let me uh, register the apologies of our Cabinet Secretary, uh, Wafula Nahumicha, who is not uh, able to join us uh, this evening. But I will deliver her welcoming remarks. 
which uh, I'll read as follows. Honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to take this opportunity uh, to co-chair this meeting. I wish to thank the conveners of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition Ministerial Meeting on the sidelines of the 76th World Health Assembly. My special appreciation goes to the UNAIDS leadership for this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting comes at a time when we are observing global trends of a consistent reduction of HIV prevention funding, despite having ambitious targets of reducing HIV infections by more than 80% from 1.5 million in 2021 to fewer than 370,000 per year in 2025, as outlined in the Global Prevention Roadmap. While there are concerted efforts to reinvigorate and accelerate our collective prevention efforts, this will only happen if we purpose to create conducive environments for those in need to access services while increasing accountability of resources and results across all our multi-sector partners. Ladies and gentlemen, financing for HIV prevention remains suboptimal, leading to inequality in access and provision of services. Furthermore, majority of this funding is from donors, making it unsustainable for most countries. These limited resources must be used prudently, and this can only happen if effective coordination and accountability structures are in place in developing nations to streamline HIV prevention interventions. Countries should increase allocation of domestic resources towards prevention and explore innovative local financing options to finance the gaps as donors scale down on their support. This will cushion financing of the HIV program from donor shocks or fluctuations as donor preferences change. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to reiterate that Kenya remains a committed member of the Global Prevention Coalition as we work towards ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Specifically, Kenya will continue to support the coordination of the National AIDS Commission's Directors Forum within the Global Prevention Coalition through the existing platforms and opportunities such as the South to South Learning Network. I welcome you to this meeting and I thank you. Back to you, Chair. There was. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for sharing the experience and also um, a reflection on um, some of the challenges that we are facing in mobilizing resources and financial resources, not only. Um, as we've seen, uh, both chairs, both co-hosts um, emphasized the critical role of international collaboration. And we know indeed that um, HIV and other infectious um, disease pandemics show how connected our world is and um, that success in some countries is only a step, but we need successes in all countries to end the pandemics. Um, and so to accelerate the response and going back to our roadmap in your tables, one of the steps, one of the uh, paths, it's clearly um, engaging um, civil society as a crucial um, path to, to end HIV. And so here with us today, we have some representatives of civil society. And I'm going to start by first passing the floor to Judy Chang. And she's the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. Judy, what is, in your opinion, the critical focus? Why is it so critical to focus on uh, key populations in the HIV uh, prevention response? The floor is yours, Judy. Thank you. I'd first like to thank the GPC for organizing this high-level dialogue and for the opportunity to address this audience. 
I'd like to take the opportunity to spotlight key populations. So key populations are the cornerstone of the HIV prevention response. It's important to focus on us because we're disproportionately affected by HIV as we and our sexual partners make up 70% of new HIV infections globally. This stark inequality in incidents doesn't happen by accident. We clearly know why we are being left behind. Evidence and rights-based HIV programming that meaningfully involves key populations is simply not being sufficiently invested in and brought to scale. For example, when it comes to people who use drugs, only 2% of us live in countries with adequate access to basic harm reduction services. Similarly, PrEP availability does not meet demand amongst gay and bisexual men. The underlying reasons for why our right to health continues to be undermined are clear, and these reasons are legal and social structural. First, we must be crystal clear about who we mean when we are talking about key populations. That is gay and bisexual men, people who use drugs, prisoners, sex workers, and transgender people. It is our communities that are made vulnerable because of colonialist and oppressive laws and policies. If we continue to force people to make choices between their freedom and their health, we will never meet HIV prevention targets. If we fail to make investments based on public health rationale, but moral agendas, we will fail in global health. Accelerating HIV prevention and preparing for future pandemics really does go hand in hand. It was the infrastructure surrounding HIV, including community systems, that mitigated COVID-19 impacts on key populations. COVID-19 also reaffirmed lessons we already knew. Health systems are not enough. We need community systems to reach those deemed unreachable. Further, the level of adherence to social restrictions amongst, among criminalized populations was low. This points to the need to look at health within the bigger frame of rights and dignity. COVID-19 also showed us that when there is enough po political will, saving lives can become the priority and policy challenges can be bypassed in real time. We absolutely need that same urgency in the HIV prevention response, and we need country leadership to get there. We need countries to fully invest in HIV prevention and community systems. As we have learned, the benefits extend beyond HIV, and this will set us up for future pandemics. We need countries to work towards the removal of punitive legal and structural barriers. Full decriminalization of drug use, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex work are needed to protect from not only HIV, but COVID and future pandemics. The key question really centers on ethics. Do we want to equip everyone to be able to respond to health threats or continue to handcuff certain communities? COVID-19 taught us that no one is safe in a pandemic unless everyone is safe. The HIV response can again lead the way in global health if we truly commit to putting the last mile first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I have to share something with you. It's one of the um, things that I'm always saying. It's I don't like the concept of the last mile because that has to be the first mile. And I think you've spoke brilliantly about that. And um, I have to echo when you say we we clearly know why we are being left behind. We need community services, rights, and dignity. And this is why I'm going to pass the floor to the next speaker. I'm going to invite Nadu Adiko. She's a project officer uh, working on promoting equal rights for women and girls with disabilities in the Planned, Planned Parenthood um, Association uh, in Ghana. You have the floor. Thank you, Monica. I want to begin, I want to thank GPC for the opportunity to represent adolescent girls and young women during this uh, dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin with a story of Abna. At the age of 19, Abna contracted HIV from a 40-year-old man who coerced her into transactional sex with a promise to fund her high school fees. <laughs> While I avoid the obvious details, I ask, what if Abna was empowered to negotiate for safe sex, 
What if she had access to pre-exposure prophylaxis? And what if she lived in a community with robust social support system that catered for her needs? You see why HIV prevention cannot wait. Many young girls like Abna face poverty, disability, marginalization, discrimination, and exploitation. These perpetrate transmission and impede the HIV response. In 2021, for every two minutes, an adolescent and young girl acquired HIV. You all agree that this is beyond alarming. Therefore, policies and laws must allow young girls not to only access HIV prevention services like PrEP, but also to complete their education regardless of their background and circumstances. Abna need not to have paid a high price for the support of her schooling. When you are empowering and implementing HIV prevention programs for young people and making critical decisions about their health and well being, please and please let their voices be heard and echoed. Thus, in reference to the popular saying, teamwork makes the dream work, young women and girls have a crucial part to play in this journey on ending AIDS. We all want to work with you. So I appeal to government here today, global leaders, donors, and all stakeholders to provide resources and commit to ensuring girls like Abna have equal access to knowledge, technologies, and support safe spaces to remain HIV free. Thank you. No, thank you. And um, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in this room to say, Nadu, we are your team. We want your dream to work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those, those examples. We were just talking before the beginning of the panel, how um, um, a story has the power to change minds and to, um, and to set us thinking about the challenges. And, um, and as you know, um, the 2025, and I know that you must have questions and reflections that you want to share, but we will have a networking event after this. And please hold those questions because I know they want to interact with, with you. Um, so as you know, the 2025 Global HIV uh, Prevention Roadmap was developed um, as a guide to achieve the target of fewer than 30, uh, 330,000 annual um, infections by 2025. So this is why I'm now going to pass the floor to uh, Dr. Angeli uh, Acherakar, which is the UNAIDS Deputy Executive Director of Programs. Um, Angeli, where do we stand in implementing the Global HIV uh, Prevention Roadmap as a strategy? Great. You Thank the you. Floor. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you for the opportunity to be here in front of your excellencies and honorable ministers and friends and colleagues to give you a sense of what the data are telling us in terms of the status of the progress in, the H in HIV prevention. Next slide, please. When we look globally, we see that HIV incidence reductions are occurring ac across the past 30 years. We are making progress, but clearly not fast enough when you look at the rightmost side of the graph with the target of 2025. The speed of acceleration needs to be lifted up quickly, and we've heard the, the note for urgency here. Next slide, please. What you see here is regional variation in HIV incidence reductions with the change in new infections. On the leftmost side of the graph, you can see that certain regions, including Eastern and Southern Africa, Western and Central Africa, and others are making progress. There are other regions that need to go further and make accelerated progress, those that need to move faster. Next slide, please. And then when we look country by country, we see a change in HIV incidence here across countries in the Global Prevention Coalition. We see new HIV infections are declining in a majority of the GPC countries, but clearly we're not at the dotted target line yet. We all have to move faster, quicker, again, with what we know works. Next slide, please. And what will success look like? We know that people-centered pr 
precision prevention responses are critical, that 95% of people at risk of HIV must be appropriately prioritized with effective combination prevention. We must remove the obstacles and barriers that prevent that access from happening, and that fewer than 370,000 new infections must be happening every year. Next slide. And as friends and colleagues have noted, and you'll see in your, your handouts there, we have a roadmap. We know what works. We know how to get there. There are 10 action points at a country level that must be implemented in order to get to the, the decreases that we need to see. Data-driven assessment, precision prevention, country investment needs, prevention leadership, community-led services, removing structural and social legal barriers, promoting integration, rapid introduction of new technologies, real-time prevention program monitoring, and strengthening accountability. Next slide. This is a busy slide, but what we want to see is green, and what we see is a sea of red and orange and yellow. This represents a status of where we are across various countries of the Global Prevention Coalition, a status of the country level actions of those 10 steps that we just outlined on the roadmap. Again, we should see a sea of green and we see red. And so what can we do together to move quickly with in order to implement what needs to happen for the people we serve? Next slide. So moving forward, and I'm excited to hear from our panelists today, we must follow the data, we must invest in prevention, scale for impact, lead with equity, and be accountable for the progress that we have agreed to deliver. And finally, moving with urgency, like everyone has said, is critical. Thank you so much. Back over to you, Monica. Thank you so much, um, Angeli, for guiding us on this um, context of, of progress on, on the roadmap, and um, and for also setting the stage for the next uh, for the for the discussion. And with this, it's my honor to pass the floor to the co-chair of the Global Prevention Coalition, Professor Sheila Tu. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, leaders in the HIV prevention response, colleagues and friends, this is a unique moment in HIV prevention response, as our executive director said. Also because several countries have shown what is possible. Yes, we have the means available to reduce HIV incidence and to develop successful prevention programs. Our panel, the very first panel, will share examples of such country successes and some outstanding challenges in reducing HIV incidence. Let me start by saying that we have many successes in a lot of our countries. To apologize that we cannot have every country presenting, but we tried by all means to take a representative sample. And I'm hoping that with each of them having just three minutes, to inspire us, we will truly <laughs> be inspired. So we're going to start off with Botswana. <laughs> Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness of Botswana, Dr. Edwin Horatao Nedikoloti, please share with us what have been the factors for success in HIV prevention in Botswana. Thank you very much, our esteemed moderator, uh, Professor Tlo, the GPC co-chair. And let me recognize the presence of the executive directors of Perspective UN and other international organizations. Let me uh, thank the organizers for affording me the opportunity to share Botswana experience with respect to the HIV AIDS epidemic. I also look forward to learning from others on the best innovative strategies in this uh, regard. I wish to highlight from the onset that our successes in combating HIV and AIDS have been realized and continue to be sustained because of the support from our highest political leadership. I also commend the great collaboration and support from the local and international development partners, many of whom are in the room. I would have done injustice 
if I do not acknowledge the contributions and participation from our communities in achieving the several great milestones. Regarding the UNAIDS 95, 95, 95 targets, as you may be aware, Botswana is one of the first countries across the world that have already achieved these targets ahead of the 2025 timeline. As per our latest AIDS impact survey, the BIAS-5, Botswana has so far attained 95, 98, 98 of this indicator. And several factors have led to this achievement over the years. Firstly, it is leadership. For over two decades, the national HIV response has been led from the highest political and governance level. The President of the Republic of Botswana, Dr. Mukwezi Eric Masisi, and his predecessors have always led and guided the response efforts. The cascade of leadership was ensured across all levels. Second, the HIV response has been guided by the domestication and implementation of global strategies, guidelines, protocols, including those from WHO, UNAIDS, PEFA, and other key partners. Third is the multi-sectoral partnerships involving government, development partners, multilateral partnerships, the private sector, and the civil society. All this contributed to the effective response. And lastly, one crucial factor was the HIV domestic financing. Government is financing 61% of the response, while 37% is externally and 2% is private. And in regards to our efforts in reducing new infections and accelerating the HIV prevention, these are inspired by the commitment to end AIDS as a public health threat by the year 2030, driven by the goal of attaining zero new infections, zero AIDS-related deaths, and zero discrimination by the year 2030. This aspiration is aligned to relevant global, regional, national frameworks such as SDGs, Vision 2036, and our national development plans. Botswana recently joined the GPC network that is in June of 2022. Guided by the GPC, Botswana is set on a trajectory to acceleration HIV prevention to end AIDS in Botswana. Having conducted the self-assessment of prevention pillars and convened an HIV prevention symposium with a higher level meeting, of course, moderated by our own co-chair of GPC, Professor Tro which was followed by development of a roadmap. The prevention roadmap will be launched in the coming month. We also recognize that at this stage, the HIV and AIDS response program is fully matured and acknowledges the need to transition to build an effective responsive health system using a people-oriented primary health care model. I thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, um, very inspiring indeed. Now, Vietnam is renowned for reversing some of the highest rates of HIV transmission through injecting drug use. By 2021, Vietnam had achieved a 62% reduction in new HIV infections compared to 2010. Your Honor, Vice Minister of Health of Vietnam, Ms. Nguyen Hyung, what have you done differently to get there as a country? Uh, thank you, Sela. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished um, guests, uh, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I would like to share with you how Vietnam has uh, reduced uh, new HIV infection by 62% uh, over the past 10 years and reduced HIV prevalence among persons who inject drugs from 30% in 2002 uh, to around 12% in 2020. First, we have a strong political commitment and comprehensive uh, legal uh, framework in the HIV response. Vietnam has uh, established a national age committee um, comprising of all relevant, um, relevant line ministries and chaired by a uh, Deputy Vice um, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, for coordinating the national HIV response, and Vietnam has uh, directives uh, of the Communist Party, a law on HIV-AIDS prevention and control, 
national strategy and hundreds of uh, uh, guidance documents. Second, we introduce and uh, strongly scan up comprehensive and rights based HIV intervention for PWIDs, especially harm reduction intervention. We have been providing PWIDs with clean needles and syringes, um, methadone, regular HIV testing, ARV and hepatitis C treatment. Uh, about uh, 52,000 PWIDs are receiving methadone treatment, including uh, take-home methadone. Uh, third, it is uh, also important to have uh, the engagement of HIV a key affected community in the HIV response, uh, in particular in the provision of information, education, communication, and uh, harm reduction services. And lastly, we could not have done uh, such much without the collective support from um, international uh, um, partners. Uh, we much appreciated support from UNS, uh, WHO, PEPFA, uh, the Global Fund for Fight AIDS, uh, TB, and Malaria, and other development partners uh, from the last uh, three decades. Uh, the HIV, however, the HIV epidemic uh, profile of Vietnam has changed in recent years, uh, with the men have a sex with men population now emerging as a key priority population for HIV interventions. Uh, we have been uh, strongly acceler accelerating uh, the outreach, provision of condom, lubricant, uh, especially PrEP for MSM. Currently, uh, there have been more than 68,000 clients on PrEP in Vietnam, and we are working on continuous scan up of harm reduction and, prop, uh, and PrEP uh, services and ensuring the long-term sustainability of this high-impact intervention. So thank you for your kind attention. Xin cảm ơn in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Vice Minister. This is actually remarkable progress. Globally, too little focus was given to HIV prevention, especially with key populations. And we see limited progress in the majority of countries with HIV epidemics concentrated among key populations. That is why Vietnam and other countries that have made progress are such important proof that effective prevention can be done. So next, I would like to invite the, the Director General of Health, Cote d'Ivoire, Professor Samba Mamadou. Cote d'Ivoire has achieved remarkable progress in the rejection of new HIV infections as well. Director General, Monsieur le Président, dites-moi dans trois minutes, what are the factors that have contributed to the success and what could be done differently? Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Je voudrais vous inviter à porter vos... I will speak in French, so you have to put your earphone. Merci. Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, chefs de délégation, honorables invités, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais à votre propos remercier le secrétariat du CGP pour euh, avoir initié cette rencontre qui donne à l'occasion à mon pays, la Côte d'Ivoire, d'échanger sur ses succès et bien sûr, ce qui est plus important, sur les défis en matière de prévention du, 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 VI, du VIH. Dans notre pays, le président a pris le VIH comme et s'est engagé résolument dans la résolution du VIH. Et c'est un acteur majeur euh, dans la lutte qui permet d'avoir nos différents résultats. Je vais d'abord présenter les, la situation en Côte d'Ivoire. En fin 2022, on estimait une population de population vivant avec le VIH à, 4, à 400 000, dont 66 de femmes. On a noté en Côte d'Ivoire une baisse de la prévalence de l'infection qui est passée de 4,7 en 2010 à 1,8 en 2022. La cascade des 3,95 est respectivement 80, 90 et 87. 
Les progrès ont été enregistrés en dans d'autres secteurs. Nous, on note une réduction de 66% de nouvelles infections entre 2010 et, 2000, et 2022. On a une réduction de transmission de la, du VIH mère-enfant qui est passé de 26 à 10 en 10 ans. Ceci grâce à une politique de prévention euh, mère-enfant importante, car aussi euh, Madame la Première Dame est mobilisée pour cette, pour cette thématique. Nous avons démarré en Côte d'Ivoire la prophylaxie pré-exposition pour les, les adolescents, jeunes et les populations clés. Si c'est un objectif que nous devons atteindre, nous devons offrir environ 3, 30 000 aux populations, 30 000 personnes vulnérables euh, la PrEP en 2023. Mais également, tous ces succès ont été faits grâce à une coordination effective des actions de lutte contre le SIDA à la fois au niveau national et au niveau des régions. Cela a permis de donner un nouveau souffle à la lutte contre le SIDA dans nos différents pays, dans notre, dans notre pays. Euh, je voudrais aussi dire, mais malgré ces succès, nous avons des grands défis. Notre grand défi, c'est qu'on a euh, au niveau des jeunes, une nouvelle, de, de nouvelles infections est représentée par les jeunes. 36% des jeunes sont la cible de nos nouvelles infections. Donc nous travaillons beaucoup sur ces jeunes-là, mais car on constate que les adolescents et jeunes disposent de très peu d'informations sur le VIH. Il faudra noter qu'ils sont nés avant, après le VIH, d'où leurs difficultés en termes de communication. Également, nous avons utilisé les réseaux sociaux et des campagnes qui les ciblent pour que ils puissent avoir des comportements qui soient euh, sains. Et aussi, nous voulons éliminer la transmission mère-enfant d'ici 2025, et cela est possible grâce au support de tous nos partenaires. Mais également, ce qui est important, c'est de rendre disponible pour moi l'usage des préservatifs lors des rapports sexuels, car cela est, cela est très préoccupant. Le taux de disponibilité des préservatifs est de 62 au niveau national, tandis que le taux d'utilisation chez les jeunes, notre cible est, varie entre 50 et 67 Nous devons rendre disponible le préservatif en tout temps et en tout lieu et intensifier la distribution de ce, de ce préservatif. Bonne touch. En d'autres termes, la, le repositionnement de la prévention est un élément essentiel de notre plan stratégique de lutte contre le VIH. Mesdames et messieurs, je voulais terminer mon propos en remerciant tous les partenaires qui accompagnent la Côte d'Ivoire pour ses résultats, l'OMS, l'ONU-SIDA, le PEPFA et le Fonds mondial. C'est avec tous ces partenaires que nous allons atteindre l'élimination du VIH-SIDA en 2030 dans notre, en, dans notre pays. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie beaucoup, monsieur Merci. le Président. Professeur, je n'ai pas touché. Oui, je n'ai pas touché. All right. OK. Um, Colombia is one of the six countries that have recently joined the GPC. So I would like to invite you, sir, the Vice Minister of Health of Colombia, Honorable Dr. Jamie Urego, to share your rationale and expectations from joining the Global HIV Prevention Coalition. Muchas gracias, señora moderadora presentaré en español. Eh, distinguidos ministros, ministras, directora ejecutiva de UNCIDA, de UFPA en Ginebra. En primer lugar, quisiera mencionar que en línea con el compromiso nacional en la respuesta al VIH, expresamos a los organizadores nuestro agradecimiento por la invitación a la coalición mundial para la prevención del VIH y aceptación a participar en dicha iniciativa. Como es de su conocimiento, nuestro país viene avanzando en la implementación de nuevas estrategias de prevención como la PrEP, el autotest y programas de prevención combinada con énfasis en poblaciones clave y vulnerables, incluyendo la población migrante y esperamos con esta iniciativa fortalecer las capacidades del país en las intervenciones de prevención. En ese sentido, y si la audiencia lo permite, expongo algunos avances en esa hoja de ruta. 
Colombia realizó en 2022 la actualización del Plan Nacional de Respuesta ante las infecciones de transmisión sexual, el VIH, la coinfección TB, VIH y las hepatitis B y C, basada en un proceso de análisis participativo de los resultados del anterior plan. En este proceso se incluyeron acciones y metas específicas en prevención combinada, con énfasis en poblaciones clave y prioritarias, tales como hombres que tienen relaciones sexuales con hombres, personas transgénero, personas que se inyectan drogas, mujeres trabajadoras sexuales y población migrante. El plan cuenta con una estimación de necesidades de inversión que alcanzaría en el periodo de cuatro años, 2022-2025, un total de 250 millones de dólares al año, de lo cual la mayor parte destinada para la atención integral de las personas que viven con VIH, garantizados bajo el financiamiento público en el marco del aseguramiento social y con las subvenciones del Fondo Mundial, recursos que vienen incrementándose paulatinamente. Frente a los mecanismos de contratación social para la, garantizar la participación de las poblaciones, se cuenta con organizaciones de la sociedad civil cuyo liderazgo es reconocido en la prestación de servicios de prevención, las cuales pueden también ser contratadas por parte de las entidades territoriales. En relación con la eliminación de las barreras sociales, contamos con una política integral para la prevención y atención al consumo de sustancias psicoactivas, bajo lo cual se promueven acciones para la reducción de riesgos y daños en personas que se inyectan drogas. Con respecto a la promoción de la integración de la prevención del VIH en los servicios relacionados esenciales, contamos con una ruta integral de atención para la promoción y mantenimiento de la salud que incluye el tamizaje para el VIH según identificación de factores de riesgo a lo largo de la vida. Sin embargo, y en el marco del cambio de gobierno que preside eh, Gustavo Petro, hay cuatro pilares que tienen que eh, ser garantizados. El empoderamiento de las poblaciones, de las mujeres, de la población LGBTIQ+. En segundo lugar, la lucha contra la discriminación y el empoderamiento para que las personas ejerzan con autonomía su vida y sus vidas y sus derechos sexuales y reproductivos ligado a la lucha contra la desigualdad y por supuesto estamos adelantando una reforma estructural del sistema de salud centrado en recuperar la atención primaria para, para alcanzar la verdadera cobertura sanitaria universal. No obstante lo anterior, desde Colombia reconocemos que el camino que tenemos es largo, sea esta la ocasión para que a través de la coalición mundial para la prevención del VIH se puedan convocar a los países y organizaciones internacionales, a los grandes donantes, para que ingentes recursos puedan ser movilizados a fin de que los países puedan contar con mayores capacidades, en particular en cuanto a la prevención del VIH. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Honorable Vice Minister of Health, Colombia. Um, to reiterate the words of our ex ex UNA's executive director, thank you for joining the GPC. You are most welcome and we will inspire each other. To all countries that have shared their experiences with us, we thank you. This also marks the end of this session. So please allow me to hand over uh, the button or the mic to my home girl, uh, Christine Sterling, UNA's Deputy Executive Director, to take us through the next session. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Um, excellencies, friends, colleagues, um, I'm delighted to moderate the second panel. I know uh, it is late um, and I really appreciate all your attention um, so late in the day and so late in the week but I'm sure my distinguished uh, panelists will um, make it exciting in the last in the next 20 minutes. Um, I'm specifically delighted because I have been following and been involved with the coalition since its inception. So I really can see the potential um, that we can have here. So hoping that um, more will follow after this discussion. We have an exciting panel of global partners who are committed to accelerate HIV prevention at 
country level. And in the next uh, few minutes, and each one of them will have three minutes, I'm following the lead of my um, of my uh, auntie. <laughs> uh, you will have three minutes, uh, all of you. We will hear from PEPFAR, from the Global Fund, from WHO, from the African Union, and then last but not least from uh, UNAIDS. Let me start um, with a friend and colleague, um, the Deputy US, US Global AIDS Coordinator um, at PEPFAR, uh, Mamadi Yila, and ask her how, what is new in the way that PEPFAR is supporting country priorities in HIV prevention. You have a new uh, strategy, you have just concluded your, your COP process. Um, so tell us a little bit more about um, what you are doing as PEPFAR to, pre to support prevention and also how it aligns to the prevention roadmap that Anjali was just introducing a little while ago. Over to you, Mamadi. Thank you very much. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here on behalf of the PEPFAR program. And as you mentioned, Christine, in our new five-year strategy, doubling down on combination prevention is a key goal and is how we will align with UNAIDS's uh, goal to reduce new HIV infections by 2025 and the 2025 HIV prevention roadmap. So what do we want to do um, in partnership with others? We want to aggressively scale up combination prevention embedded in equity and sustainability with PrEP provision as a key intervention. We want to give clients an ever-expanding product choice, especially long-acting products. We believe this will enable greater uptake and continuation of prevention services and PrEP overall. We want to be part of the leadership in market shaping to help ensure a responsible at-scale at introduction of no novel prevention products. And we want to invest strongly in building a large demand for prevention with a focus on expanded communication, normalization, evidence-based behavior change, and alternative delivery models to ensure individuals seek prevention solutions. UN needs this goal of achieving 10 million persons on PrEP by 2025 is also PEPFAR's goal. We will work on two things, increasing access and product choice and promoting introduction of long acting products. For our COP23, we, which covered a two year cycle for 2020 through 2025, we have further <laughs> emphasized person-centered prevention approaches. We want to follow the science and the epidemiology. Let them tell us what to do. We must target our specific populations with their specific needs and use adapted strategies and interventions based fully on science so our prevention is effective. We must treat and provide services for the epidemic we have now, not the one we used to have or the one we wish we had. Know your populations and match them with the right interventions. PEPFAR's HIV prevention effort is by design well aligned with the 2025 prevention roadmap and um, highlights the importance of HIV prevention as a key element of country and community plans and visions to facilitate sustained impact and investments supportive of overall global health priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Mamadi, and uh, particularly delighted to hear the emphasis on person-centered uh, prevention approaches and um, your note on choice and increasing choice for, for people um, in different communities. So thank you for, um, for that. I'll go directly to um, Peter Sands, the Executive Director of the Global Fund, to hear some reflections from you, Peter, about how the Global Fund is increasingly supporting prevention at country level. Thanks, Christine. And I want to start by just reflecting on the fact that to get the kind of change in trajectory implied by the slide that Angeli showed earlier requires a step change. Now, we're unlikely to get the kind of step change we want on the money side in the near term. 
the investments the Global Fund is making with countries and partners in prevention is increasing. It's about a billion dollars in the current grant cycle. And in the next grant cycle, although it's too early to be definitive because countries have either just submitted their funding requests or about to, the indications are that it will increase. But I wouldn't pretend that that is a step change. And likewise, while we've seen some encouraging signs from countries on the domestic resourcing side, it's a struggle, I know, for many of you as health ministers to convince your finance ministers to put more money into prevention, which we should be better at convincing them of, because frankly, every single individual that gets infected, it's not just a loss to that individual and their families, but it's a loss to the national treasury over the longer term. The economic ROI of prevention is extraordinarily high. But given that the money side of it is going to remain challenging, I wish it weren't, but I think we have to be realistic, it's all the more important that we have a step change in the things that don't cost much money or that use the money more effectively. So removing social and legal barriers, discrimination, stigma, barriers to accessing services is not that expensive, but it makes the money go a lot further. Community-led interventions are not just effective at reaching the people most in need, the key populations, but they're also, on the whole, very cost-effective. Providing comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services to adolescents has a huge return on investment way beyond HIV. The whole point of the language of provision prevention in the MoMAP is around targeting prioritization. And I still think that collectively we could do a better job at tailoring services to the needs of those who are most affected. And we should be imaginative and bold. At a time when money is constrained, we need the political courage on policies around access to harm reduction services, on policies to reduce gender-based violence, on different forms of providing access to PrEP and other tools like condoms, say through pharmacies rather than through medical facilities. The more we can make access easier through highly cost-effective methods, the more the money will stretch and have more impact. I absolutely agree with Mamadi's emphasis on um, PrEP and on PEP and on long acting uh, interventions. The more we can get those scaled up and available to those who most need them, the more impact it'll have. So more money is definitely part of the answer and the Global Fund will certainly um, play its part in that. But we've also got to do the things that don't cost money, and we've got to make the money we do have go as far as we can. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Did everybody hear me? Probably not the, the um, uh, interpreters. I'm very sorry. I'll go to you, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, to ask you about the fact that infectious disease pandemics will always require international collaboration. And we have had two examples about um, some of that collaboration at the funding level. But collaboration goes further than making resources available. How can we further enhance international cooperation in HIV prevention as a model for future pandemic responses? Thank you very much, Chair and uh, Christine, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, dear Winnie Mbianema, Executive Director of UNEMS, dear Peter Sons, dear Mamadi Ila, 
Esteemed guests, colleagues and friends, good evening. The responses to ongoing pandemics like COVID-19 and, and global epidemics like HIV, tuberculosis and malaria offer us a strong base from which to further strengthen health systems, primary health care and pandemic preparedness. The Global Fund, PEPFAR and the 12 organizations that form the United Nations Joint Program on HIV, UNAIDS, provide essential resources and frameworks for our strategic and international cooperation in a highly dynamic and complex global health context. HIV prevention requires cross-government coordination and international collaboration to ensure a multi-sectoral wall of society and a wall of system approach that includes affected communities and civil society at the center. As we seek to further strengthen our efforts to reduce HIV infections, we must simultaneously seek to expand our approach to, for broader impact. For example, when we seek to prevent the sexual transmission of HIV, we must ensure our efforts are also preventing unintended pregnancies and the transmission of viral hepatitis and sexually transmitted infections, especially among key populations and the most vulnerable. Harm reduction efforts for injecting drugs use should focus on all bloodborne viruses. And the el elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV should also include a focus on stopping the transmission of syphilis and hepatitis B. When we work to ensure that voluntary medical male circumcision in high HIV prevalence countries is made available, we must do so as part of wider sexual and reproductive health service provision for men and boys. And our work to offer pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP to population groups at substantive risk must similarly, must similarly be linked to sexual health services and opportunities for STI screening. We need to continue to be agile in our response to new science. Last year, WHO was able to translate the newest evidence of efficacy of long-acting cabotegravir for PrEP into WHO global guidelines within just six months of receiving reg regulatory approval in the US. We have already seen how the networks, system, and approaches in place for HIV prevention can also be leveraged for pandemic preparedness. The extensive community-led service networks and the community-based health workers and prevention leaders played central roles in responding to COVID-19 and the multi-country outbreaks of MPOX. We have tools available, data systems that are expanding, and strategies and policies that are harmonized. Enhanced international cooperation on HIV prevention can help can help pivot resources and political support to reaching those most often left behind and to ensuring impact expense behind, behind HIV where it makes sense. We need prevention tools and systems to be well resourced in global fund funding proposals and explicitly supported in PEPFAR country plans. We know that thanks to close collaboration with many of you here for this event, this is happening as we speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And thank you for um, speaking about integration in particular, one of the 10 actions in the roadmap and reminding us around the, the fact that we need to be agile um, in our responses in, in prevention. Um, let me turn to Professor um, Giulio, who has allowed me to call him Professor Giulio, which I'm very thankful for, um, Director of Humanitarian Affairs and Social Development at the African Union, and also a former Minister of Health of Madagascar, who is well-placed to talk to us about the role that political leaders can play in preventing HIV and future pandemics. Over to you. Merci beaucoup. Uh... Permettez-moi de parler en langue française, s'il vous plaît. Bon, euh, la question est, est très, très, comment ça, très critique, dans le sens que moi, je n'ai pas le droit de dire à vous qui êtes des leaders politiques, qu'est-ce que vous devez faire. Je ne suis pas en mesure, bien que je sois un ancien ministre, hein, mais j'ai pris de la leçon quand même au travers des quatre orateurs qui vient Côte d'Ivoire, Botswana, Vietnam et Colombie. 
sur la base de leur dire, je me suis rendu compte de l'importance de l'approche multisectorielle. Et lorsqu'on parle de l'approche multisectorielle, c'est d'abord à l'intérieur même du système de santé. Nous savons pertinemment qu'il existe plusieurs maladies opportunistes liées à l'infection en VIH. Alors, devant toute occasion, nous devons avoir cette opportunité de dire que l'infection en VIH pourrait être pré euh, prévenue sur la base des différentes approches que vous venez de nous dire tout à l'heure. Alors, je me suis euh, aligné donc, à ce que disaient tout à l'heure les, les quatre orateurs venant des pays frères, que l'approche multisectorielle est très importante. Deuxièmement, l'approche multisectorielle en dehors même du système de santé. Quand j'étais ministre, je parle par exemple avec les collègues de, 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 de la justice. Il faut distribuer de seringues à usage unique. Eh bien, le ministre de la justice dit « Attention, Julio, hein, toi tu veux dire à d'autres d'utiliser la drogue ?» ben, Donc, j'étais inefficace de discuter avec les autres collègues ministres. Si on va, par exemple, prendre le cas de la, euh, de le ministère de l'Éducation, si on va entrer, dire à l'école primaire comment lutter contre l'infection en VIH, comme si nous allons euh, dire aux enfants d'entrer dans la vie sexuelle, non, ce n'est pas tout à fait ça. Alors, le rôle des leaders politiques, c'est d'avoir cette capacité d'avoir cette capacité d'être vraiment multisectoriel dans le cadre de la lutte contre l'infection à VIH. Et pour terminer, quand ma collègue Angélie a présenté les, les chiffres tout à l'heure, il y a des pays dont l'incidence et la prévalence sont encore vraiment très grandes. Et j'aimerais poser une question. Sommes-nous en mesure de maintenir notre capacité en cas de catastrophe, en cas de conflit armé Sommes-nous en mesure Merci infiniment. Thank you very much and thank you for giving us another reminder. Um, or an example of those um, difficult political decisions that we need to make um, um, or you have to make as political um, leaders for for um, prevention. Um, Winnie, I'll turn to you now, um, the executive director of UNAIDS. Others have talked about the fact that this is the moment uh, to make a greater collective um, investment in prevention. And we are the Secretariat as UNAIDS of the Global Prevention Coalition. Can you say a little bit about how the Global Prevention Coalition can and does support countries? Sure, Christine, and thank you. Excellencies, let me start by saying that today we see that success in prevention is possible. It is possible. There's a real opportunity to move this, and it's a huge opportunity. First, we have the tools and the technologies, though they are not reaching everyone who needs them, but really the tools that are coming on, that exist already, are amazing, amazing. We have inequality, though, in access to these tools. The basic proven tools, such as condoms, clean needles, opiate substitution treatments. These have been here with us for a long time, but not everyone can access them. We also have inequality in access to new innovations, such as various forms of PrEP, including long acting injectables, the ring, the vaginal ring, we need to close this gap 
of access to the new innovations. And I'm so glad that Viv is here. Viv, you're doing the right things. You're increasing access to long acting injectables, but you could do more and others could do more. And I thank WHO for accelerating and moving fast the pace of bringing these tools to, um, to, to pre-qualification. At the same time, we also have good examples of successful prevention programs. These exist for all key populations, each group of key populations, for young women, for uh, gay men, men who have sex with men, for sex workers, for people who use drugs. We can learn from these programs that are successful in many of your countries here around the table. The coalition, which is a platform that we facilitate, is a platform for sharing such good examples, moving them from being small islands of success in different countries to becoming a norm. That is the value of this platform, sharing these good examples. The coalition is also, plays a, a critical role also in maintaining focus and commitment so that countries work towards achieving the targets that they agreed to in 2025. The coalition, its roadmap, a 10-step how-to guide, gives us a pathway to make real measurable progress. The coalition partners include governments, UN agencies, as you see around the table, international and regional organizations, civil society networks, and we also want to invite in the private sector. Viv, you have heard me. We now need to turn possibilities into realities and to hold each other accountable. The platform is also for that, to have peer pressure, to put ourselves on a race to the top so that we are competing in achieving success. That is the vision. Together, we can make prevention work in all countries. So as leaders, two things I could ask you to drive implementation in your countries to move to scale. One, of course, it is ensure adequate funding for HIV prevention. The discussions are tough in our countries, I know, but your leaders, and we are with you to discuss, to convince, to make the case, and I think Peter made a really good case for funding and also made the case for those actions on prevention that need minimal funding or even no funding, like decriminalizing. How much money do you need to repeal a law? It's just a stroke of a pen. There are some things that we can achieve with political will with very little funding. So let us, the second thing I would ask is act on the policy and structural barriers that hinder access to HIV prevention. These are the ones I'm talking about that many don't even cost money. Or if they do, it's just a little money. So leadership is key here. We can be leaders that will put our countries on track to end HIV and not be the leaders who passed on the problem to the next generation. Let us seize this moment of opportunity. Thank you. Back to you, Christine. Thank you, Winnie, um, and thank you for the call to everybody, and also for reminding us that the GPC is a platform for learning, but also a platform for accountability, for holding each other accountable and ourselves accountable for the progress or the lack of progress we are making um, on the targets that we have agreed on. This um, concludes this session, and I will hand over um, to um, friend and colleague uh, Mitch Warren, the executive director of AVAC, and the other co-chair of the GPC, um, to give us the closing remarks. Over to you, Mitch. 
Thank you so much, Christine, for giving me the hardest task to try to summarize what you've all been through. Uh, but I will say with all protocols observed, uh, and I look around this room, and, and I know that you all entered as uh, ministers, as heads of programs, as heads of UN agencies, as head of global uh, organizations. I hope though we all leave as advocates, as advocates and champions for what we can do. And you've heard this actually, Monica began this. We said we were gonna go on a journey tonight. And it is perhaps odd to think of having a roadmap. How many of us have used a roadmap in the last couple of years since you've had a phone where you just plug in the address to your next meeting and you walk down the street following your phone? We don't even know what roadmaps are. So when we think about this, this next generation, our task is to really be responsive to them. And you heard this from so many of the people tonight. And I think what for me is so exhilarating is that whether you heard it from civil society, whether you heard it from heads of global agencies, whether you heard it from the fabulous country representatives, the messages were actually, if not the same, remarkably similar. But the challenge for us, and Winnie did this so beautifully just now, um, prevention has never, been more possible. It has never been more opportune. You heard that from pretty much every speaker tonight. But as you all know, because you've all been in sessions all week and it's only Wednesday, <laughs> not to depress you, the things we say in these rooms, the things we say in Geneva don't prevent infections. They're the things we do when we walk out of that room. And I want to encourage everyone to, to think closely to what you heard tonight. We have more options than ever before for prevention. When I know I entered this field too long ago to remember, and we had very few options to provide that person at risk. We didn't even have antiretroviral treatment in those days. When you hear about the 95s and the 98s, it also means there are twos and fives left behind. And while we've made tremendous progress on treatment, our progress on prevention has not been commensurate with the task. And it's so um, important that you heard tonight, global leadership and national leadership recommit to prevention. It has never been more opportune. But I wanna remind everyone the difference between an option and a choice. Options are the biomedical products we create. Condoms, clean needles. We now have a vaginal ring and an injectable for PrEP just like we have multiple COVID vaccines. Those are options, but options don't end pandemics. Mm. It's only when those become choices. And what's the difference? It's everybody around this room and it's everyone involved. It's messy because to make an option a choice requires the legal reform, requires the funding, requires the health provider, all cadres, community led, as well as in the health center. It takes us to make those options choices for the individual who might be at risk. But we all have choices walking out of this room. And I know I don't wanna be around here in another decade and think we've squandered what I believe to be our most opportune moment in 43 years of this epidemic when it comes to prevention. We have never had a better chance and history will judge us harshly. And someone's gonna look back on this tape because you know someone's out there watching and they're going to record this and they're going to say, I heard you say these great things in 2023, but we didn't, we didn't bend the curve of new infections. Why didn't we? It's not because we don't have the tools. It's because we don't have the ability to translate them. So I want to do that as a call to action for all of us going forward. And I'm reminded actually of one of Winnie's predecessors, the founding director of UNAIDS. Peter Piat said to me once in Zambia, I don't know, 20 plus years ago, he said, risk gets a bad name in HIV. And risk is a bad word. We, we, we don't want to label people. But he said, we have to learn to take risk. Smart investments, like Peter was describing. And so leaving this room, and we're going to go upstairs. This is the good news. I'm, I'm almost done. Um, there is a reception upstairs to network, to engage with each other. There are actually posters from countries to see the progress, to see what is possible, and to see what will be judged harshly if we don't continue this task, because complacency is the virus's best friend. So we go upstairs to the first floor. Please um, engage with each other. Um, the countries have put a lot of work into um, documenting their experiences, their lessons. They can um, take, I'm reminded to tell you to take your posters back to your country, but show them off. And I'm also reminded that it's competitive. 
I noticed all of your eyes, those of you with country um, flags in front of you, when that scorecard came up from Anjali, you wanted to see where you were. <laughs> Luckily, the font was very small, but it's available online. Turn it to green, turn it to green, um, and that's that's in our hands to do. So turn the, turn those opportunities into the choices that we all make going forward. So thank you all for taking the time to being here tonight. We know you have many competing priorities and please do step up to the first floor. There's an elevator right here and the stairs right in the middle that take you upstairs. Uh, and thank you all so very much. It's funny, I got early said, Oh, can you send us your printed remarks? So I, yeah. I, I, I don't do like printed remarks. Yeah. I do printed remarks. <laughs> Oh, you were beautiful.